everyone, um, and apologies for not being able to join you in person. I had an issue at home, um, but uh, and I had to cancel my, my trip at the last minute, but um, thank you so much for the opportunity. Very happy to be here. Uh, today, I'm going to present our study on uh, gender inequality, poverty, uh, and situations of displacement in Somalia. Um, basically, this is a, a joint uh, a paper with Lucia Hanmer, who is our esteem um, chair today, and Juliet Santa Maria from the IDB. Um, what is the motivation for this study? Well, there that, that is a, a growing body of literature um, in development suggesting that if, um, displacement causes disruption in household and family structures which is uh, related to specific uh, gender disadvantages because of inequalities that we see in the different contexts. Um, and this, of course, will have uh, effects on, on differences in poverty that are not easily accounted for. Um, in, in this context, we basically aim to answer three uh, research questions. The first one is, um, whether uh, female headed households are actually poorer than non IDP households, both male and female headed. And this is basically taking the traditional approach to analyze uh, poverty using the headship concept, which, um, as, as you probably know, has been already contested in the literature because it's not necessarily um, the best comparison. These households tend to be systematically different. The second question is whether um, there are specific households, IDP households living in and outside settlements that are more likely to be poor than the non-IDP counterparts. And here we take a step forward um, to go beyond the, the headship concept and propose an approach also building on previous studies, which takes into consideration uh, alternatives to get at the gender dimensions of poverty using the characteristics of the households that go beyond the head of the house, the sex of the household head. And third, uh, we analyze whether these alternative classifications actually add value to the conventional analysis of poverty based on hedge. For the analysis, we use the Somalia High Frequency Survey. The second wave, uh, which was collected by uh, in 2017-18 by the World Bank, and includes a large sample of internally displaced populations. And finally, uh, for the empirical strategy, while well, we use a descriptive analysis um, of, of these household structures, and uh, for a more rigorous analysis, we use linear probability models. Why studying uh, Somalia? Well, it is a very interesting case study, both from a development and a gender perspective. Uh, from a development perspective, well, Somalia is, is one of the poorest uh, countries in the world. It is estimated that almost uh, 3 million people have been forced to flee um, internally because of conflict, uh, natural disasters, and so on. Um, and they represent approximately 17% of the population. Um, as mentioned, uh, one of the causes of this displacement is the floods and droughts that are, are recurrent in the country, but also um, an ongoing conflict and the situation of insecurity. Many IDPs are settled in informal um, like, uh, settlements, uh, which are characterized by poor housing conditions, overcrowding, uh, lack of access to basic services, um, high risk of gender-based violence, among others. So from a gender perspective, it is also very interesting because Somalia is one of the countries where female labor force participation tends to be um, low compared to other uh, countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and also compared to men in Somalia. Uh, but at the same time, women tend to be economically active, particularly participating in, in family farming, for instance. And there is also some anecdotal evidence suggesting that there has been a change in gender roles precisely because of the disruption in family structures. So women have adopted um, more male-oriented tasks, tasks such as um, livestock, livestock uh, trade. Um, and then, well, as mentioned, GBV is particularly is prevalent and particularly in IDP settlements and child marriage is, is also prevalent. Um, so for the empirical approach, we um, 
classify households in, in three different using three different um, al uh, alternatives. So the first one is using the traditional headship concept, which compares male and female headed households using um, and then for poverty, we use a, a, an income a per capita income measure. Um, then the, the second uh, alternative is to classify households according to their demographic composition. So here we are using the basically the household roster, which identifies the relationship between household members, their age and sex. And we come up with five different um, types of households, starting with a male single caregiver, which for instance, consists of a household with a, a male adult, um, which is in charge of uh, either a children, elderly or disabled, and there is no spouse in that household. Then the same idea, but with a female single caregiver, followed by the traditional neutral household of, of a principal couple of women and men with children, then households with multiple generations, sort of extended households to put it in another uh, way. And, family, and, and finally, families without children, which um, tend to have the lower dependency effects. And the third uh, alternative to look at the gender dimensions of poverty in this paper is to look at income profiles. So we classify households into um, seven different groups using um, the number, um, age and sex of the people who contribute to the household income. So for instance, we have um, the first family type would be no earners, people who don't receive any remittances. So basically they depend on humanitarian assistance. Um, then we have uh, remittance recipients. They don't have any people actively working in the labor market, but they depend on, on these um, uh, cash flows. Um, followed by female single learners. So basically it's, it's an adult, female adult um, with uh, only one person contributing to the household income with many others, which could be dependents, um, um, children, elderly, and so on. Um, then the same idea with male single learner, um, then a group of uh, households with uh, an equal number of male and female learners, which tends to to be similar to the couples with, with children in demographic composition. And finally, uh, two categories which try, which try to capture households that have multiple earners. So in one case, uh, multiple female earners, adults, and then in the other case, uh, multiple uh, male earners. So just presenting here are some descriptive statistics of these three uh, groups. So the first one, um, if we use uh, the measure, the headship measure, um, first we see that 70% of households in Somalia are poor. However, when we look at the headship concept, and this is based on self-reported headship in the interview, in the survey, sorry, uh, we see that poverty rates tend to be higher among male-headed households uh, than female here in households, regardless of the displacement status. And again, we are here, we're using a, a, a poverty measure based on income per capita. So uh, there are assumptions behind that, but this is contrary to what we would have expected uh, given the knowledge that we have about the context. When we look at the demographic composition though, uh, which is again a measure that captures burden of care, dependency ratios, and so on, and it uses the relationship between gender and age of household members. We see that, um, contrary to the HIP concept, what we see here is that it is female single caregivers that tend to be at a higher risk of falling into poverty. And even though poverty rates are in general high, as I mentioned at the beginning, there are some um, differences here. Um, for instance, when comparing two extremes, right, that the female single caregiver and the male single caregiver. And um, as expected, families without children tend to have the lowest poverty rates uh, when comparing um, using the demographic composition. Then when we move to the income profiles, which tries to capture access to labor market and economic opportunities, and uh, using information on the number and sex of people who contribute to the household's income, 
We see that as expected, northerners tend to have the highest poverty rates, but they are followed by female single learners. Again, similar to what we are seeing with the demographic composition. Um, and at the bottom, we have male single learners, which even though, again, tend to have high poverty rates, they are statistically um, lower than those faced by female single learners and other um, household types, such as equal contribution households. So to conduct a more uh, rigorous analysis of, of this, um, the value added of these categories we estimate uh, linear probability models, separate estimations for IDPs and non IDPs. Here, the dependent variable is um, a dichotomous variable, basically one if the household is below the poverty line and zero otherwise. And we control for different individual and household characteristics. Within the household characteristics, we include the family types using the demographic composition. Eliana, you have two and minutes left. Thank you. Um, so what did we find? So for demographic composition, we see that um, it is uh, a female single caregivers, we confirm that finding, that uh, tend to have a higher por uh, probability or odds of falling into poverty compared to families without uh, children that tend to have the lowest poverty rates. This is also the case for couples with children and multi-generational. Here I'm just showing selected results of the regressions. Then when we look at non-IDPs, we see that the only statistically significant difference is the poverty rates between um, families without children and multiple generations with children. When we go to the income um, profile, what is interesting to highlight here is that it is um, the fact that IDP households in particular benefit from having multiple earners and particularly the uh, probability of falling into poverty is much lower uh, for majority female learners when compared to no earners. For non-IDPs, it is mostly for majority male learners. And here again, female single caregivers tend to be quite vulnerable. Poverty rates are, are similar to those experienced by um, no earners. So what are the policy implications of our findings? First, um, obviously, that it is very important to consider uh, family structures and the disruption caused in those uh, structures um, to analyze poverty, and particularly for policy making. So, even though um, poverty rates are very high in this context, still targeting remains important. And, and I put here an example of the Bax Nano program, which is a national cash transfer. And um, they take a very um, serious approach to targeting among those variables that they use. This is a, an index of uh, distress and also the characteristics of, of the houses. And the program so far has been um, quite good. Um, it's very important to know that had we, um, yeah, thank you. Had we stopped um, at, at headship, we would not have uh, known that single caregivers are quite um, vulnerable to poverty. And then for the other um, policy implications, I'll leave it here, but basically considering that the restrictions that women face are quite relevant in the design of economic opportunity programs, um, as well as considering the option of using mobile money to expand uh, and scale up social protection and humanitarian assistance. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay. Thank you very much.